The two of them shared the bath together, with Circe lying back in Tana's arms. Tommen must be spared the worst of this, she told the Mirish woman. Marjorie still takes him to the Sept every day, so they can ask the gods to heal her brother. Sir Loras still clung to life, annoyingly. He is fond of her cousins as well. It will go hard on him to lose them all. All three may not be guilty, suggested Lady Merriweather. Why, it might be that one of them took no part. If she was shamed and sickened by the things she saw, she might be persuaded to bear witness against the others. Yes, very good. But which one is the innocent? Ala. The shy one? So she seems. But there is more sly than shy in her. Leave her to me, my sweet. So in part one, we discussed the mysterious house Merriweather and determined that they are likely agents of the Aegon cause. Then in part two, we analyzed Circe for a feast for crows and saw that while Orton Merriweather was gunning to give the Red Wines control over the Ironborn, Tana was accusing the Red Wine twins of wanting to commit adultery with Marjorie. And in part three, we discussed House Red Wine's twin problem and their inheritance position for Highgarden, making them excellent candidates for being Aegon supporters. But what does this all mean going forward, and why exactly did Tana tell Cersei that the Red Wine twins were in love with Marjorie? And why were they hanging out with Marjorie in the first place? Well, let's explore the role of the Red Wines in the rest of A Feast for Crows. First, let's return to Tana's report on the Red Wine twins in Cersei 4. What is it you all find so amusing? The Redwine Twins, said Tana. Both of them have fallen in love with Lady Marjorie. They used to fight over which would be the next Lord of the Arbor. Now both of them want to join the Kingsguard, just to be near the Little Queen. The Redwines have always had more freckles than wits. It was a useful thing to know, though. If horror or slobber were found a bed with Marjorie... Cersei wondered if the Little Queen liked freckles. Dorcas, fetch me Sir Osney Kettleblack. Now first when hearing this story, we have to ask, does it hold water? Well, like all good lies, there is some truth in Tana's story. With Horace and Haber being twins, it isn't clear who will inherit the arbor, and even if one twin is named heir, the other twin would feel slighted. Their father had the opportunity to resolve this issue after the Blackwater, but suspiciously passed it up. Now, we don't know if Horace and Haber actually bicker, as Tana says, but succession is a realistic thing for these twins to butt heads about. Additionally, there's truth in the story in that Osney Kettleblack does confirm that the Redwine twins are visiting Marjorie. In fact, as we will see, they're visiting quite often, so something is bringing them around. But there are some things about Tana's story that don't make sense. First of all, at this point in our story, there are no open positions on the Kingsguard and none expected to open. I mean, unless you're Dornish and are in the know. But also, Marjorie, the Queen, is married to the King of the Seven Kingdoms, are the Redwine twins really hoping for a clandestine affair with Marjorie? An affair that, if discovered, would be punishable by death, if not the Wall? Additionally, giving up a great lordship like the Arbor for the Kingsguard is quite a sacrifice. The Kingsguard is normally for younger sons with no hope of inheriting. Horace and Haber giving up one of the greatest lordships for a non-existent Kingsguard spot to participate in a dangerous affair? It's an extremely unlikely tale. Hardly believable at all. Unless you're Cersei. You see, unlikely as this story is, it's not a unique story. No, in fact, it's Cersei and Jaime's life. Jaime did in fact give up Casterly Rock to join the Kingsguard, just so he could have a clandestine affair with Cersei, a woman who would become queen. And they continued this affair as she was queen, risking their lives. Tana has, quite cleverly, and a bit brazenly, told the story of Cersei's life to her. It's a tale that she is uniquely gullible to. In fact, Cersei falls for the tale of her life twice. Once when Tana tells her that the Redwine twins want to join the Kingsguard, and once when she tells Cersei that Loras and Marjorie are committing incest. And implying that Marjorie may be open to an affair is the very thing that fuels Cersei's entire plan to frame Marjorie for adultery, thus creating division between the Lannisters and the Tyrells. The declared mission of the Aegon cause. The story is exactly what one would expect from an Aegon supporter and is very Varys-esque. However, there is a question to why the Red Wines were specifically spun into the tale and not, say, Sir Talad the Tall. Well, we know at this point in our story, the Red Wine fleet is just past the Straits of Tarth and is on its way to Dragonstone. The fleet is in a prime position to strike King's Landing, or it's in a prime position to stop Aegon's Landing. 
Additionally, with red wine control of Dragonstone, there may be hope of finding a dragon egg, a piece of propaganda that was of great importance in the Second Blackfyre Rebellion. And so it may be that Taina was hoping an accusation against the twins would offend Paxter Redwine and push him over to the Aegon cause. Or if the Redwines were already supporters, give him political cover for not attacking Aegon as he crosses. And Cersei does ponder implicating Horace and Haber for a split second before deciding against it. We aren't sure of Cersei's logic at this moment, but it should be noted that the Redwine twins are notoriously homely, mocked by everyone as horror and slobber. The likelihood of them seducing Marjorie would be extremely low, and it does seem that Cersei knows that she dare not risk offending the Redwines. Later on, when the Blue Bard implicates the Redwine twins under torture, Cersei forces him to recant the accusation. She certainly understands the power of the Redwine fleet, and it's the reason she's trying to build her own fleet. And so, whatever her logic at this moment, Cersei does not rely on the Redwines for her plan, and instead uses handsome Osney Kettleblack. Still, Taina is truthful when she says that the Redwines are coming around to visit, and we know this part is true as it's later confirmed in Cersei 5 through the Kettleblack brothers' testimony. Singers. She's a fool for singers and jugglers and such. Knights come round to moon over her cousins. Sir Talad's the worst, Osney says. That big oaf don't seem to know if it's Eleanor or Allah he wants, but he knows he wants her awful bad. The Redwine twins come calling too. Slobber brings flowers and fruit, and horror's taken up the loot. To hear Osney tell it, you could make a sweeter sound strangling a cat. The Summer Islanders always underfoot as well. So, singers are coming around and knights are coming by to moon over the cousins, especially Tal the Tall. Talad appears to be looking for sex, according to Osney. Haber and Horus are indeed knights, but it's a little unclear if they're mooning over the cousins. Jalabar Zo, we know, is stopping by to teach the cousins the summer tongue. Now, we aren't sure who these other knights are, but in Cersei 6, Cersei wants more names besides Talad and the Redwine twins, and Taina claims a whole slew of people are stopping by. Sir Lambert Turnberry, Sir Bayard Norcross, Courtney Greenhill, Sir Portifer Woodwright, Sir Lucatine Woodwright, and Taina adds Picel, who we later discover is providing moon tea, as well as Jalabar Zoe, and she mentions that Mark Mullendore is in the mix, as well as three singers, Hamish the Harper, Alaric of Aeson, and the Blue Bard. Later in the chapter, Cersei actually runs into Marjorie, and her entourage contains some of who Taina names, including the Red Wine Twins, Talad, Mark Mullendore, Jalabar Zoe, Sir Lambert Turnberry, Alan Ambrose, and the Blue Bard. And we get a final tally of who visits Marjorie when the Blue Bard is arrested and tortured in Cersei 9. He names Sir Tal the Tall, Lambert Turnberry, Jalabar Zoe, the Redwine Twins, Osney Kettleblack, Hugh Clifton, and the Knight of Flowers. This final testimony is very believable as the Blue Bard is desperate to name names. Now notably, there are only four men who appear in every testimony. Tal the Tall, Jalabar Zoe, and the Redwine Twins. And so we can surmise that these four individuals are visiting the most often. We know Tal the Tall's purpose. He wants to bang either Eleanor or Alla. In fact, the evidence suggests that he is having sex with Eleanor. Eleanor is the oldest and considered a flirt. Marjorie suspiciously only proclaims that Alla and Mega are innocent children. Plus, Alla and Mega are premenstrual as far as we know, so the moon tea would be useless for them. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, we also know Jalabar Zoe's excuse. He's teaching the cousins the language of the Summer Isles. But why on earth are the Red Wine twins there? According to Taina, it's because they're in love with Marjorie, but as we went over, this is not really believable. Still, they're bringing flowers and fruit, and Haber is learning to play the lute. They appear to be courting women, and they are putting in a great deal of effort, certainly more than anyone else, save maybe Talad. But if they're not courting Marjorie, who are they courting and why? Well, let's examine who would make sense politically. Let's keep in mind that the Red Wine Twins are exceedingly good catches in the feudal system. We are specifically told that they're considered good enough matches for Cersei, which puts them on par with Oberyn Martell, Balon Greyjoy, and Willis Tyrell. Who on earth would be a sufficient match? Or matches, rather. There's two of the Red Wine Twins. And why would such eligible men feel the need to woo their would-be brides? Well, as we mentioned in part one, Marjorie comes to King's Landing with 11 female companions, Alary Hightower, Mega Alla, and Eleanor Tyrell, 
Yana Fossaway, Leonette Fossaway, Septa Nysterica, Lady Graceford, Lady Bulwer, Meredith Crane, and Tana Merriweather. Hilary and Leonette appear to have left King's Landing, and Nysterica is a Septa, so we can assume that the Redwine Twins are not trying to woo them. Now, we actually see the Redwine Twins escorting Yana Fossaway around, and yes, if one were trying to take Highgarden ahead of some disinherited Tyrells, marrying a Tyrell would make sense, just as Lancel married a Derry, though the Redwines are half Tyrell already. The problem with this, though, is that Yana is already married. So unless there's a plan to kill John Fossaway, we can assume the Redwine twins are not interested in their aunt. Tana Merriweather is also married, and although we aren't sure about pregnant Lady Graceford, we hear no talk of bastards or widowhood, making it seem like she is married. Additionally, Eleanor Tyrell is betrothed to Alan Ambrose, and betrothals are a rather difficult thing to break. Just ask Rob Stark. Joffrey needed specific permission from the High Septon to break his betrothal to Sansa. And so, for potentially single women, this actually leaves us with only Meredith Crane, Mega Tyrell, Alla Tyrell, and Alisane Bulwer. Now, Mary Crane is of House Crane of Red Lake, which is on the border of the Westerlands and the Reach. We know little about her other than that she is loud and chubby and she likes to go hawking with Marjorie. We also don't know anything about where she is in the line of succession for Red Lake, though she is not the Lady of Red Lake and she's never called the heir either. And so, based on what we know, all in all, her stature seems a bit beneath the Red Wines. Next is Mega Tyrell, also loud and chubby. She is the granddaughter of a cousin of Mace Tyrell, though we aren't sure if that means first, second, or third cousin. Whatever the case, it makes her somewhat distant from the main Tyrell branch. She and Marjorie are actually, at best, second cousins once removed, and she is far, far down the line of succession for Highgarden. That said, marrying a Tyrell, any Tyrell, may be seen as a good move if one is attempting to usurp a lordship over a disinherited line. So there's that. Also of note is that Mega is half Meadows of the Grassy Vale, which is on the border of the Stormlands and the Reach. And Lord Elwood Meadows, a Stannis supporter, is currently Seneschal of Storm's End. We aren't sure how John Connington is going to take Storm's End, by a trick he claims, but it seems that Lord Elwood, if not killed, will be soon captured, meaning that the Grassy Vale and House Meadows will be forced to bend the knee to the Aegon cause. Interestingly, Tana mentions that Mega has a new suitor every fortnight, and there is talk of Mega marrying Lady Alisane Bulwer's brother. Perhaps a half-brother, Alisane is the lady? Though Mega doesn't seem interested in this marriage and prefers Mark Mullendore of the Uplands. Why Mega is so coveted is a mystery, Perhaps everyone thinks Lord Elwood will be disinherited for his apparent Stannis support, increasing Mega's importance? Though if she has a string of suitors, they all seem to be knights with no high lords of note. Next, there's Ala Tyrell, shy and pretty, a girl who loves singing and who has a nice voice. Now, quite notably, later on, Tana goes out of her way to convince Cersei not to name all of the cousins guilty and to name Alla Innocent, so we should definitely pay special attention to her. So Alla Tyrell is also the granddaughter of a cousin of Mace Tyrell, a second cousin once removed to Marjorie, far, far down the line of succession for Highgarden. Again, not close to a red wine in stature, though marrying a Tyrell could be a good move if one is trying to steal Highgarden. Alla Tyrell is also half Beesbury, whose lands, Honeyholt, are upriver from Old Town, and quite significantly, Alla Tyrell is full cousin, real cousin, to our fourth lady, Alisane Bulwer. That is, Alla Tyrell and Alisane Bulwer are more family than Marjorie is to her so-called cousins. Now, Alisane Bulwer is only eight years old, but is far and away the most appealing bride for anyone in a political sense. She is the Lady of Black Crown across the Red Wine Straits from the Arbor. Now, it's worth talking about the family situation here. Alisane is in King's Landing and her father is dead, meaning Black Crown is likely ruled by Alisane's mother Victoria as Dowager. Victoria's brother Leo is Alla's father and married to a Beesbury, and Victoria and Leo's father is dead. Now we aren't sure if Dowagers can make marriage packs in Westeros, but certainly Victoria and Leo would have input into who Alisane marries as her last surviving relatives. Now this does make an interesting situation geographically. As we can see, Black Crown is downriver from Old Town, and Honey Holt is upriver. An alliance of these houses would surround Old Town, the seat of the High Towers, 
the other significant power in the reach besides the Tyrells and the Red Wines. And if we're talking about Aegon's invasion with Blackfire friends, Black Crown is across the bay from Three Towers, the seat of House Costain, fierce Blackfire supporters. This would mean a total domination of the Red Wine Straits and a stranglehold on Old Town. Incidentally, the High Tower's other bannermen are House Kui, Blackfire supporters, and House Mullendor, as in Mark Mullendor's house. And so let's put ourselves in Horace and Haber's shoes as they hang around Marjorie Tyrell. What pairing gives them the most power? And let's remember again that the Red Wine Twins are considered on par with Cersei, Willis, Oberyn, and Balon Greyjoy in terms of feudal stature. Marjorie, Yana, Tana, Lady Graceford, and Eleanor are all off the table. Mary Crane and Mega Tyrell may help relations between the Red Wines and House Crane and House Meadows, but are only so-so matches, far beneath the Red Wine Twins. Only one match approaches the stature of the Red Wine Twins, and that is Alisane Bulwer. However, Alisane is a mere child, meaning one has to win over the family. And the closest thing to family Alisane has is Alla Tyrell, Alla's father, and Alla's aunt. On a side note, it's worth mentioning that Tyrek Lannister was married to a child and the head of a house, Lady Hayford, and Horace Redwine mocked Tyrek as wet nurse. So the Redwines are certainly aware of the practice of marrying children. After all, Marjorie is married to a child. So another important thing to note is that Horace Redwine is taking up the lute. However, we never hear of him singing or learning to sing, just playing the lute. And the skill does couple well with Alla, who sings when coaxed with instrumental accompaniment. And it notably doesn't pair with Mega, who's not a good singer and likes to sew instead. So all in all, it seems that Horace and Haber Redwine are bringing flowers and fruit and learning to play the lute to impress Alla Tyrell and, through her, Alisane Bulwer. And a double wedding would give them a Tyrell bride to help them usurp Highgarden, while securing the Redwine Straits and surrounding Old Town, perhaps inducing the High Towers to join the Aegon cause, or acquiesce to the usurping of Highgarden. It's nothing less than a total domination of the Reach for House Redwine, which explains what Horace and Haber were doing in Marjorie's company, and helps explain why Tana wanted Alla spared from Cersei's plan, and it all aids a rapid takeover of Westeros by the Aegon cause. Now, this is all well and good, but doesn't Euron throw a wrench in this whole plan? He does, and we'll be talking about that, Aegon's Landing, and even Harrenhal as we wrap up everything next time in part 5. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.